Friends, I'd like to invite you to turn to today's focus passage, which is John chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 24 through 40, if you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or device. So our focus passage is John 6, 24 through 40. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were around, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who, whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life. And I will raise them up on that last day. Well, church, fall is upon us. Thank goodness. But that also means that we've now entered a three-month stretch I like to call the gauntlet of nutritional doom. <laughs> if you were doing okay before now, just get ready. I think it started last Wednesday when uh, Ben prepared us a wonderful Wednesday evening meal. By the way, if you aren't coming out for our Wednesday evening meals, please come. At 5 o'clock, they are delicious, and we'd love to see you there. I think we had uh, chicken, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, green beans, just some other sides, and of course, salads and the rolls, which we already talked about with the kids earlier. But even the rolls weren't the most important portion of the meal. It was the cupcakes with orange, yellow, and red icing. Because fall is upon us, and we have entered the gauntlet of nutritional doom. That's what October is all about, isn't it? I mean, from this point on, these next few weeks, I know my kids will likely be bringing home pieces of candy from uh, various Halloween parties and fall festivals and, and all of those things. And um, I charge a pretty high parent tax, by the way, 30%. Um, But October will come and go, and October 31st, we will replace all the Easter candy with Halloween candy, and then we'll move into November, and yeah, we get a little bit of a respite, right, for three or four weeks, because then there's one day, and then the three or four days afterwards where you make up for all of it, it's Thanksgiving, where your plate looks like the 1992 USDA food pyramid. You have 6 to 11 servings of bread on your plate or pasta or grains. You have three or four meats. You have two or four vegetables. And where it says to use sweet sparingly, nah, you know what I'm talking about, choir. We don't listen to that on Thanksgiving. We, we eat them not just that day, but the days after. And then we, of course, move into Advent or Christmas. Can you believe it? We're already getting so close. We move into the month of December. Christmas cakes, Christmas treats, Christmas feasts. You name it. So if you were doing well, yeah, not so much anymore. It's really bad news if what they say is true, that you are what you eat. 
Not good news for the next few months, because these next few months encourage us and challenge us to, to consume sweets and carbs and foods high in cholesterol and th- do bad things for our body. And we know that, but we don't care. We like to eat them because they taste so good. The vegetables and the fruits, they take a back seat. And it's not just our, our bodies, our minds. I mean, what are we doing to ourselves when we load up ourselves on all of this sugar these next few months? So physically, we do become what we eat, but even more, it can affect our minds and our bodies and our spirits. And despite all that we know, our food becomes us, and we still tend to gravitate towards that which is not so good for our well-being. Sure, it tastes better, but shouldn't we be able to overcome that urge? We're a product of what we consumed. Yeah, we can speak of that literally with our food, but figuratively... We are also products of what we consume with our eyes and our ears. For instance, we consume social media like candy. And as we've said multiple times in this space, it quickly becomes unhealthy. And it leads to anxiety and depression and irritability and lack of attention. Or we have a rampant consumption of cable news programs, especially those in the evenings that give us opinions. And before we know it, we've indulged in a daily recipe of of prejudice and unfairness and misunderstanding and being challenged to think ill of people who might vote a little bit differently than we do. We engorge ourselves on the need for societal approval or community standing or popularity. And before we know it, we've feasted on these things which are about as good for us as a slice of stuffed crust meat lover's pizza. But sometimes it's not like a buffet where we can go to the salad bar and choose something else. Sometimes those platters are set right in front of us and we have no choice but to consume. Sometimes we have no choice but to consume the grief in front of us. Sometimes we can't set aside stress. Sometimes we cannot get rid of or choose another option rather than guilt or shame. Or sometimes we have been force-fed the food of discrimination or bullying or abuse. And that transforms our minds and bodies and spirits as well. So where can we find health and nourishment for our souls? That's where our series ends today where Jesus uses his final I am in the book of John to say, I am the bread of life. Jesus refers to himself as a type of food, as a type of nourishment. So we ask today on this final week of the I am series, what is truly our source of life and health and faith and existence? And so we will end with this final phrase, I am the bread of life, which Jesus says to many people who were chasing him because they had just been fed literally. They had just been fed on the hillside. The feeding of the 5,000 was just before the scripture that we read today. Jesus had gone to the other side of the lake, and the crowd said, I want some more of that. So they said, where's Jesus? And they finally found him. They said, we've been looking for you. How did you get here? And Jesus immediately already sees through their desire to find him. He says, you're not looking for me because you saw a sign. You're looking for me because your bellies were full and you want me to do it again. It's probably worth stopping here at this moment and calling attention to Jesus' words of the sign. You did not see the sign. Next week, we will begin a new series where we will look at the seven signs in John. Seven signs or seven miracles that Jesus performs not just as miracles in and of themselves, but as a sign of who God is in the coming kingdom. So we will begin there next week. But Jesus says, you didn't see the sign. You're just ready to to fill your bellies again. And he goes on to say, don't work for food that perishes. It's not to say that you shouldn't eat, but, but don't put all your stock on the things that waste away. There's something more valuable for you to consume or to hustle for than the bread which you just ate. There's something more than immediate gratification and physical satisfaction. Nothing material ever satisfies forever, does it? I don't care how much you eat at Thanksgiving lunch, you'll be hungry again, won't you? I don't care if you've had a hip replacement or a knee replacement or a new valve. You know that those won't last forever either. 
As good as that medical advancement is, trust me, we know it will not last forever. Even after a birthday or Christmas and you've opened up your new, your new toys or your new gadgets, well, your gadgets are obsolete as soon as you unwrap the gift. But there is one gift we can consume and can consume and consume and consume. It never goes out of date. It never withers away. And it is the spiritual life-giving gift of Jesus but we tend to be more like the crowds that day, don't we? We say, Jesus, I need more, more real bread. I need more cash. I need that job. I need that status. I need that influence. I need power. And yet we know that each of these can come crumbling down in a heartbeat. Some of you may have felt that or experienced it personally or in your family or in your friends. You've seen it. But Jesus says, before you put your faith in any of that, Remember from whence your nourishment comes. Today, First Baptist Church, we must ask the serious question, do we really want the bread of life? Do we want to feed on it? Do we truly desire a deeper relationship with Christ? A type of consumption which challenges us to lay aside our obsession with worldly satisfaction and to walk daily with Jesus. And so in a moment, we will enter into the sacred time of Lord's Supper together. And as we take part, you should ask, we should ask, am I what I eat? Am I becoming more like Jesus? Am I becoming more full of grace and compassion and truth and love? Are we as a church feeding on grace and mercy and sacrifice and love and sharing that with each other? Are we not merely feeding on it, but are we offering it back to our communities and world, in a world in need of truth and love. I once read an account suggesting that we have the imprint of the central work of Christ in our bodies because of what we eat. I found this to be a fascinating illustration because nearly every food we consume is the result of something that has given up its life or whose life has ended. It may be a plant or a tree or a vine whose existence or whose fruit may have died on the vine once it was picked or harvested, but then it gives us nourishment and life. How about that? Or it might be a sentient being whose life was given for us to consume to help us build the blocks of life in our own body. Something gave its life that we might find life through our consumption. We truly are what we eat. And on this World Communion Sunday, we will testify to the ultimate truth that we have life because he gave us his. We might be tempted to consume or focus on our differences, differences in language or race or ethnicity and culture, but for Christians around the world who daily feast on the love and grace of Christ, we see this as a beautiful portrait of God's creation and we are marked and nourished and we live by something much deeper than our differences. And so we testify now that there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism as we prepare to take of this Lord's Supper together. Benjamin Sparks says, what we have to offer is Christ and by Christ and because of Christ. First and foremost is our soul food, which lasts forever and does not change with the changing circumstances of the church or the world. It is soul food that we desire and soul food in which we will rejoice long after our bellies are full. I'm excited to take of this Lord's Supper with you on World Communion Sunday, as Christopher mentioned with us earlier a day where Christians across the world are gathering together to take of this meal. And so we join with Christians not just across this city and state and country, but across the world in celebrating the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for giving us the bread of life and pray that we would be sustained and nourished by your everlasting grace and mercy. As we prepare to come to the table this morning, may we be reminded that we have the options to feast on all kinds of things in this world, but you call us to feast on a bread.
that does not go bad, that you will always satisfy our hunger, that with you we will never go thirsty. Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 